Hey there YouTube, I'm Ikitsu, this is the Ikitsu Times, welcome to my channel, welcome back to another Tuesday talk show. So I want to get talking a little bit more about that uh, sort of setting that we had there, and uh, I'm going to be talking a little bit about how I'm setting up this game, and kind of my theories behind it, and the way I'm doing it. So one of the first things that I did for it, and why it's going to take a long time before I actually execute it into reality, is because I do prefer working from what the players are going to be building as characters, or I prefer working from a setting, and then introducing the characters, and seeing where that pushes the story. Um, there are certain campaigns where I create like an end goal, this is going to be what you're working towards, this is what you're going to actually do, um, and I always sort of advertise those as such. But generally speaking, I find that those, you know, they're easier to write, they're easier to make, they're easier to plot for, make the encounters for, because you know what's sort of going to happen. And you just tell the players that that's what you're doing because you don't want to have to put in as much work as you would in a more freeform campaign. But if you have a DM that's capable of this, and I, I don't necessarily think that I am all the time, of running a very story-driven and compelling and interesting campaign based around the characters' actions and the consequences of them and what they're doing and what they want to have done, and the world that they're in all interacting off of each other, it can be a lot more satisfying and a lot more interesting than simply running a campaign of this is where your end goal is, you're supposed to beat the Dark Lord, and, and blah blah blah. So. Um, what I did here is I started with asking the players what sort of characters they want to do. I told them what sort of setting I wanted it to be and sort of the main theme of it. Because, you know, I, th I think that that's fine to sort of request that. Um, so it's a squad-based tactical one. It's going to be based around e every player playing a squad sergeant and their followers. So it's going to be 11 people. And we're abstracting this heavily um, rather than single actions from each individual person in the group. It's going to be basically essentially group actions plus uh, specialists that can basically make uh, take actions in lieu of uh, a standard shot or something like that. So that's kind of the premise there. Um, it's going to be based around uh, the idea that you could either be an incredibly powerful heroic character yourself, uh, the Shadowrun rules do sort of allow for that, or you can sort of be very good at leading your squad and making your squad better. So that's kind of the general setup and principle of that. So I asked them what sort of faction they wanted to uh, play as, and this is going to be an evil campaign. Um, and I'm not too surprised by this, it's been a while since any of the DMs in our group have offered to run an evil campaign properly. So. Um, I'm not necessarily that surprised. Now, obviously, we have ones where like people people play as explicitly evil characters. That's that's pretty much you know standard in a given campaign. You might have one token evil player in the group. Um, I've been that player. Other people have been that player. But um, it's rare where you just say, okay, everyone in the group is evil, um, or follows evil, or has evil directives, or something like that. And that's sort of the case with uh, what we're doing here. And I've been in a couple of those campaigns. They're usually a lot of fun. A lot of uh, sort of lending loose, I guess, in those sorts of campaigns. A lot of people in our group are not necessarily actually that evil, though, when they play these evil campaigns, so it just ends up being sort of a kind of formal pragmatism. Um, but in any event, uh, we're going to be doing that style of thing. So this is set in sort of a futuristic uh, setting that, as well, so that's why we're using the Shadowrun rules, and I explained that that's why we're using the Shadowrun rules, but it is still ultimately the D&D uh, type of universe that my other DM had set up there. Now, uh, in this sort of way, I've created sort of what they're going to be within it, uh, the framework. They're going to be followers of Hextor, or rather, not necessarily religious followers of Hextor, the deity of like law and tyranny and stuff like that, but they're going to be working in his army. He's going to be one of the generals under the uh, greater deity Nerul, um, and it's a setting where the gods are very active, where they fight against each other actively, where they participate actively in things, where they bestow tremendous powers on their followers, where they actively recruit people... Um, wherever they can, and their centers of power are very much uh, heavily influenced by them personally. Um, and they sort of push and pull against one another in, a, in, in these sort of very large god-like uh, struggles. Um, and despite that, like, they can't necessarily just go out and fight things by themselves, because once they're in the mortal realms, another bunch of deities could just go beat them up, basically. So they have to do it sort of through the bestowing of power to other people, um, and actively guiding people, and so on and so forth. Uh, because, you know, if they're in their home plane, they have a, they have a lot of advantages in, in terms of combat and stuff like that. They're in some ways more vulnerable that way, though, depending on the rulings. But um, it does make it so that they're more secure, so they can't be easily taken out by other gods. So that's kind of what's going on uh, in that sort of sense there. They can give guidance, they can uh, give items, they can bestow favors and stuff like that. But they can't necessarily go out and fight personally all that easily. Um... But this does mean that uh, the followers of Hextor and so on and so forth have these tremendously powerful armies uh, led by these people who have been bestowed huge 
portions of their god's power who are capable of out going about and doing uh, tremendous things. That's not necessarily what this campaign is going to be about. It's going to be about smaller goals for a smaller group of people. Um, and we want to sort of limit the scope, therefore, from that titanic galactic struggle that is sort of uh, at the backdrop of all of this and keep it more focused on something that's going to be a little bit smaller scale. And I'm going to be restricting it from um, that sort of gigantic galaxy-wide sweeping sort of thing to a sort of more local level. And um, while the, the sort of struggle is going to be taking place on an entire planet, of which I haven't fully fleshed out or detailed yet, um, I'm actually going to restrict it even further to a single sort of uh, continent or even a single country on that continent. Um, now, this planet obviously is not going to be one of the core planets of any of the particular factions. The only way that you can sort of have a meaningful engagement without being a titanic galactic struggle is by having it in one of the corners, in one of the places where all the different factions sort of merge and try and uh, jockey for control of it without having to invest huge military power because it's not necessarily worth investing huge military power into it. So instead they send light troops, they send a few uh, garrisons, they send raiders to try and disrupt the enemy. Um, and try and establish a presence there and, and control over the place without necessarily investing in huge amounts of their own troops there. So that's sort of going to be the stakes at play there. It's going to be whoever wins this earns a significant amount of personal glory and potentially gets off of this sort of uh, secondary front and becomes someone much more important and much larger conflict in scale that's uh, outside of it. And I don't necessarily think that the larger conflict would actually be more interesting. Um, I think that if the players are made well aware that if they are an important, say, uh, colonel in the larger war, it's just going to be them pushing a like uh, stack of papers around while they try and send huge wads of troops over against other huge wads of troops in a direct clash against one another at some uh, fortress somewhere that's going to result in both sides getting pretty much obliterated over enough time. It's not going to be about uh, sort of interesting decisions and glory, it's just going to be people on a strict hierarchy working on timetables that have been given down from Hextor basically his high clergy have sort of written it down in detail and then it's sort of gotten distilled down throughout each of the branches that's sort of what the larger galactic consequences of the uh, uh, of the main struggle are like uh, for all the different sides there but for these smaller ones where they're more independent where they're further away from the command and control centers where their stakes are lower and they've got a lot less effort put into the command and control um, I can make it so that the factions are allowing a lot more autonomy between the individual groups and that's sort of going to be how I can make the stakes a little bit more personal, a little bit more interesting. So for that, we're making this planet sort of one of the uh, outskirts that's largely evaded the, the eyes of the sort of major major powers and major factions in, in any sort of significant sense there. Um, we're going to be putting uh, a small representation of the various different good uh, species on the planet. But there's sort of underlying... Um, so, so the evil deities, to a certain extent, have to rely on cultists and so on and so forth to get uh, active recruitment and to get their people to infiltrate places. They, generally speaking, can't afford to just be very blatant about their presence in certain uh, communities and so on and so forth, especially in places where, like, you, generally speaking, wouldn't want to be uh, an active uh, open worshipper of one of these evil deities because people would sort of, like, not like you for obvious reasons. Even if they also were active... Uh, worshippers of other evil deities like they, they don't necessarily all like each other directly and of course you know that it, it makes it obvious that they're going to act in an evil way um, so what they're going to be doing is trying to subvert parts of the population um, subverting resources and getting small presences on the ground without other people necessarily knowing um, rather than directly trying to form colonies and, and peaceful settlements and stuff like that that's more what the sort of good guys are going to be doing um, so of the three three factions, there's going to be these sort of colonists that are going to be coming down from the good aligned places. From um, the other faction, the one that's uh, outside of the good evil axis, um, you've got the uh, Union, and they're going to be putting out research outposts. And uh, then, of course, there's going to be lots of cultists on the ground trying to sort of subvert things, get ready for an assault to take the planet when they get a chance to, to uh, dominate the um, colonists and stuff like that. And that's going to be how they take these types of planets, is they let the uh, good guys do all of the hard work of establishing these colonies and so on and so forth, but then they take it for themselves, um, is how we're going to have them operate. So what we need to do then is uh, figure out what the stakes are going to be and try and escalate them, because as it currently is, it's going to be interesting, I think, to try and uh, do that, just sort of uh, take out colonies, try and grab them in, in quick little uh, bits and pieces and so on and so forth, and try and make it so that, you know, the reinforcing forces that try and uh, lift up these quick assaults, try and uh, repel them, try and retake the land and so on and so forth or what have you but um, 
I think that what we're going to also be doing is uh, related to what uh, my, my DM has actually done in his version of the setting. So in his version of the setting, at this point in time, um, there has been the Far Realms in the background of his setting for a long time now. And he's taken a book uh, page out of the book of the Harry Dresden universe in that the uh, Autumn Court, or, or sorry, the uh, Fairy Courts um, have been holding back this incursion of the Far Realms for, for millennia at a time and so on and so forth. And um, their soldiers have sort of formed the bulwark against that for ages. But now that the entire sort of universe has become this sort of weird pacified state and they've becoming uh, been more and more pressured from other forces from the other side, that means that they're starting to collapse in that sort of sense there. So in his version of reality, they're enacting this sort of ritual to rip away these sort of outer planes, which is a sort of a part of the D&D cosmology that I don't want to get into because it's very complicated. Um, but sort of rip that away and sort of sacrifice the lives of millions and millions and millions and billions and trillions of people to uh, sort of close the gateway that allows the Far Realms into the material plane. So that would end that threat forever sort of thing. Um, and the reason that they can do this is because there's no grand evil. There's no evil left in his version of the universe, really. Um, there's functionally a whole bunch of theocracies that all follow and worship good line deities. There's a few crippled uh, evil deities that can't really enact any sort of uh, damage against the good line peoples because they've been so thoroughly beaten in wars in their past. So an example of this would be Grumsh, who actually was one of the catalysts for a lot of this problems. Uh, these problems. Another would be the character uh, that one of my friends played who created another faction of merchant princes and so on and so forth, who for some reason, like, th this is a person who created a merchant faction that doesn't use trade ships, they use, like, warships for trade, um, which means that they're not profitable, uh, to say the least, but uh, I could get into the math of that later. But, um, so you've got those sorts of factions, and they're so ineffectual and weak by comparison to the combined forces of, say, uh, Moradin and Coralon Lorathane and Garl Glittergold and Yondala and stuff like that and, and Bokub even um, that they just basically got crushed in early wars um, without very very little uh, um, to do with anything so since they got crushed so easily it's been peace and prosperity for most of the good line factions for forever so when they are called upon to sort of sacrifice themselves there's plenty of people who are willing to do that for the greater good so on and so forth and everyone else gets to live you know relatively peacefully because there's nothing threatening them and so that's sort of how they deal with that threat I think that there's going to be other factors at play after this um, now that there's sort of a dark ages of the populations have been severely depleted and there's now this sort of gap in sort of power everywhere um, for the record, my, my faction that I created is constitutionally incapable of enacting this, so what they did in a political move. Um, so for the record, my DM actually uh, does consult with me a lot about what he thinks my faction would do and how they would act in certain ways and how they would re respond to certain things and what they would invent or create in these sort of situations. Um, because I think he does trust my world building skills to a certain degree and he thinks that uh, he likes integrating a lot of the stuff that I create into what he's using. Um, so he often tells me actually spoilers about what's going to happen in one of his campaigns. Now this one ended up um, being one that uh, he, he was going through and he decided not to use it, but he did actually tell me about the sort of premise and principle and setup uh, that was going to be the prologue to the campaign before we actually ever got into it. Uh, he's still working on something relating to this, but I think he's, he's thinking of pushing it even past this date. But um, yeah, so what, what my faction ended up doing was v pledging that they would protect the um, remainder of the good line peoples from whatever remained of evil. And uh, so that's what they ended up doing. So um, they, they didn't sacrifice themselves, took a whole bunch of uh, evil people out, basically, um, and, and that was about it. Leaving them in a sort of very protective but uh, dominating position in the galaxy that he had sort of set up there. Um, by contrast, though, in my version of the setting, there's these... Th there's no way to do this. You can't enact this because the good line faction is going to say, well, we can't do that because we will get immediately wiped out by the forces of Nerul. Um, and the faction that I had created would say, well, we can't really just easily wipe out all the forces of Nerul without horrific losses to ourselves, so we're not really committed to doing that. Um, and of course, the forces of Nerul are just like, well, we're going to wait until someone weakens themselves in some stupid ploy to go wipe out everyone else. Um, and that's sort of what the sort of dynamic and the balance of power is right now. So this means that the fairy courts have can't use that plan. They have to use something else as their sort of main plan to deal with the situation. So what they've uh, what what's in, involved what's evolved in sort of my setting is that instead of letting um, the forces of the far realms actually just stop existing, stop being coterminous with reality, they've realized that because these three factions have been in this sort of balance of power state and they've been in this constant power struggle. Everyone is extremely militarized. 
all three of the factions have extremely high degrees of military competency. All three of them use very large armies. All three of them use a lot of spacecraft. Um, and like, th this is the sort of war where every faction is losing billions of people every year um, and can continue going for the indefinite future, uh, as far as they can tell. Um, so this means that each of these factions is capable of committing tremendous amounts of firepower and resources if harnessed against it to defeat the Far Realms, and they can even do so while continuing to fight each other. So that's the, going to be sort of the difference between my DM's version of the universe and the one that mine is, based on that small difference, that his doesn't have a greater deity of evil, that he has no one who can create a coalition and axis of evil uh, to oppose good. Whereas in mine, since we do have that, they can sort of become this sort of different um, continuum. And one of the more interesting things is that uh, the faction that I created actually kind of represents law more than anything. Um, they're very much a, a, a law-based society, one based around rules and form formalities and regulations and stuff like that. Um, they don't really have any sort of hierarchy, but despite that, they're still very much based around what people should be doing in their place in society. Um, so what we end up with is the sort of situation where there's a kind of good evil struggle, but there's also going to kind of be this chaos law struggle uh, that's going to also be happening, which I think is going to make that sort of more... Um, more interesting and of course none of the other like law doesn't necessarily get along with good and doesn't get necessarily get along with evil um for the record one of the reasons why my faction doesn't actually go to war with evil and and do that is because they actually do want to maintain the sort of balance of power to a certain extent they know that if they wanted to take out in a rule they could but they, to do so they would have to start conquering all of that territory or they'd have to start giving it away all to the good line people they don't want to do either of those. If they're conquering that territory, that's something that is going to be expensive, it's going to be costly, um, and is not ever, ever going to really pay off. A lot of those plants have been strip mined to the bare bones by the evil factions immediately. The peoples there are uneducated, undereducated, malnourished, and often don't have the sort of cultural upbringing that they want. Um, so what would happen is they'd sort of like leave that all as dust or whatever, and then all the good line people would fall into there potentially and and take it over but then suddenly the good line faction becomes much stronger than them um because they've got all those extra resources all that extra manpower even if they've got struggles they'll eventually sort of emerge from that stronger than uh than the union um whereas if they sort of occupy all that territory it's going to incur a lot of cultural damage to themselves that they don't want to necessarily take by taking that much land and those many people that are that culturally different from themselves that quickly um you know they don't mind taking in people from other cultures they just do it slowly um, so there's sort of this dynamic and that sort of back and forth there. They, they want to maintain the sort of status quo as they slowly expand their powers outwards rather than doing it quickly. Um, the faction I created was very long term, very, uh, generations of planning sort of thing going on there. So that's kind of the decision that I made. Um, an example of that is how I described to my DM how we, I plan on conquering territory. So the way I planned on conquering territory, um, with this faction was, uh, they offer tremendous benefits to people who are farmers. Um, they give people a lot of extra pay to become farmers in their territory. So if you're a farmer in a neighboring territory, you can hear about this place where it's like, well, you get better rights, you get land, you get huge pay, uh, your children get to go to school, uh, they, they'll become something better than farmers or they'll become highly paid farmers. Uh, you get a free home, so on and so forth. So you get a whole bunch of these benefits. And like the union is taking huge losses in doing this, but they end up getting all the farmers. And while the farmers are fleeing out of the provinces or territories that they initially lived in, or the peasants or the serfs or whatever, are trying to escape in every way that they can to this new place of opportunity, they're going to end up with a labor shortage in the farms and in the fields in the territories where those people are fleeing. Um, at the same time, the union is taking all the produce and agriculture that they're getting from all these additional farmers and from the fact that they're very good at enhancing farmers, and they're dumping that food into these cities that are adjacent to them, meaning that farmers are going out of business anyway, um, causing a flight to the city. And then once they feel like that city cannot manually sustain themselves with their food production anymore, they embargo the hell out of them and they blockade all their ports. So um, I'm not exactly a friendly person, but uh, that's sort of how they do things. This takes a long time to set up to the point where a, a faction is going to be in this situation where it's like, well, we don't have any farmers. We don't know how to farm properly anymore. Um, we've received all our foods from cheap imports and suddenly all of our food is gone just in an instant. And the only option we've got is to capitulate to these people who are sort of standing around us. They didn't even fire a shot and we're kind of screwed. So that's sort of the type of uh, planning that I used for this uh, faction in particular. Um, 
And it did come about from the fact that I was able to create it from a character who was extremely, extremely good at um, enhancing agriculture. Like that was actually his character specialty uh, of all things. So in any way, that's kind of the uh, setup for that faction. But um, the other two factions are also fairly long planning. Um, the only one that's not necessarily that long planning because it has so many conflicting views and goals is the Goodaline faction. They have a lot of greater deities that are extremely powerful and have tremendous influence and power and, and peoples that they rule and they're only fighting against one greater deity, uh, which is Nerul. But Nerul has that sort of singular vision about what he wants and that is perpetual conflict and warfare. Um, whereas the good line factions just want to secure their own borders and get peace for themselves. So that's kind of the dynamic that we're going for. So one of the things that I now need to do at this point is just sort of flesh out what each of the factions does, what they fight like, what their weapons are like, how they get their weapons, um, who has colonies, for example. Um, for As an example, I don't think really elves, for example, in the D&D setting, in the classical sense, would have that many colonies because they are very insular, they have isolated communities in their traditional homelands, and they reproduce very slowly. So it doesn't make sense a lot for, for them to colonize that much. So they might have some that lived there originally, because this is going to have been a planet that was indigenously inhabited. But realistically, you're looking more at dwarves who have uh, gone to the planet in search for mining prospects. You've got like halflings who are there for agricultural prospects. I've got gnomes who are followed for their mercantilism, uh, and so on and so forth. So you've got all these different groups, and, and of course, you know, humans colonize things. That's what humans do. But you've got all these different groups that are going to be there that are forming these sort of in independent sub-factions that are not necessarily cooperating with each other, but aren't necessarily competing with each other either. Um, and then you've got sort of uh, the various different sub-factions of Nerul who don't necessarily get along and may come in conflict with the party as well, uh, competing for glory or competing for slaves or competing for booty or something like that. Um, and then, of course, there's the Union and their different uh, allies that they've got access to, whether it be the Illithids that they might come across or you might come across a group of some of their other more technologically advanced factions that they've got uh, as allies. So any of those could be possible. Um, and I would like to sort of flesh those out and make them feel unique and distinct from one another while still grounding it in real sort of sensible military decisions and tactics and ideas. Um, but sort of follow along with the sort of lore and fluff of those individual races. So we'll see how that works out. But yeah, that's what I'm kind of working on right now. Uh, hope you found this episode enjoyable. And of course, as always, hope to see you guys all next time.